Uh, Johnny Harris, uh, Johnny CIA. Johnny CIA did a every U.S. Uh, lead coup map. Which I don't know if he's gonna do an anti CIA video here or a pro one. There's we'll a see. weapon that powerful countries to use pee, to get rid of. Uh, I do have to pee real quick. I'll be back in a second. Of leaders they don't like, leaders from other countries. It's called a coup. It's a French word that means a punch or a blow because it kind of means coming in and forcibly punching out a government from power. No elections, no process, just power being seized, just someone being pushed out and someone being put in. Coups happen in so many different ways, but I wanna show you how the coup has been used by the United States of America as a tool to get what they want on the world stage. So let me walk you through some of the major US-led coups over the years to show you that while it sometimes seems like we live in a world full of order and rules, the reality is that the most powerful countries will often get their way by whatever means necessary. Okay, so here's how I'm defining the US-led coups that I'm gonna put on our list here. Number one, they were successful. There's a lot of failed coup attempts. We're leaving those out. Number two, there must be at least one US government official involved in the coup. And number three, we need concrete evidence that the US was actually involved, not just speculation. While the US has been involved in tons of regime change efforts around the world, we landed on a much shorter list. These are the coups that I think best exemplify how this no way oh no is he saying wait is he is he saying that like the list is actually much shorter than the than the uh, the the real list tool has been used for international power over the years let's start here first of all you can't oh he, what are the oh he admitted the failed coups okay Wait, maybe this is not that bad. This is not that bad. No, 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 no. This could be not that bad. I mean, a failed coup is still a coup d'etat. I don't think he's saying that, like... I, I don't think he's saying that those aren't, like, actual coups. You might spend five hours here so bad, carefully craft a CIA propaganda designed to, designed to justify future regime change efforts, particularly in the independent China. country of Hawaii. It's 1893, and the U.S. is feeling like the Hawaiian queen is a threat to American control over sugar. It's sugar that's being grown by the descendants of white American missionaries who had settled in Hawaii over the years. So the U.S. sends a military ship with hundreds of troops to show up to Honolulu, and they overthrow the queen, installing one of those descendants of the Christian missionaries, Sanford B. Dole. Wait, he's only counted the ones that have evidence, it seems? No, that doesn't mean that these are the ones that have evidence. He's only counted the ones that the CIA has declassified, is what that means. Because all of those other coup attempts and failed coups and everything else has plenty of fucking evidence. It's just like... Acknowledgement is what uh, is, is lacking. Some of them do have tacit endorsements or acknowledgements, especially in the case of like Venezuela, for example. Like a big marker for an American coup is when the Chamber of Commerce's uh, leader uh, is appointed to the presidency of Venezuela immediately after a coup happens. And then the American government takes 25 minutes to recognize the Chamber of Commerce president as the new president of fucking Venezuela. That's a coup d'etat. It might not directly say that that's a coup d'etat, but that's a fucking coup d'etat. It's a failed one because the people immediately took to the fucking streets, but that's enough evidence in that regard. Like, I, holy shit, what more evidence do you need? As the new president. Notice his last name? Yeah, this coup was one of the US's first, and it set the stage not only for the new Hawaiian president's family to grow their powerful international corporation, which was based in Hawaii, but also for Hawaii to be annexed, to become a part of the United States. I made a whole video on this coup because it's pretty wild and there's so much going on here, and it was really a turning point in showing how the US could remove leaders from power in faraway places, something that they start to do a lot more of. We're going to move on to the next coup, but I need to thank today's sponsor who makes these videos possible. Bear the block. CIA. Period. Oh, and Nord back into the map. I got to get out of here because things are about to heat up. We got a lot more to cover Wait, on Chile's these coups. Not in the this? next coup has to do with Spain. Well, actually more like Spain's colonies. Spain's glory days have come and gone. They are a declining empire, and there is major resistance in their colonies, especially in Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. Meanwhile, the U.S. is a rising empire, and they already are pretty uncomfortable with Spain having colonies like 100 miles off their coast. 
But at the same time, that why is my PFP Hitler? What? I don't even know where my profile picture would be. You said my profile picture is Hitler. You said this image is Hitler. First of all, if there's one thing that is like super prominent about my profile picture, it's the mustache, right? And it's literally like Hitler's most noticeable quality is his mustache. And this is definitely not a Hitler mustache. Also, red is the color of communism. Black would be more uh, fascist. Well, black can be communist too, but... They don't love the idea of true independence for places like Cuba or Puerto Rico. These are strategic islands right in the U.S.'s neighborhood. And like Hawaii, American companies have money invested, particularly in Cuba. Independence might mean them getting kicked out. So the U.S. delves into this fight between Spain Brown. and their colonies. Black they use the anarchist. explosion of an American Navy ship as their excuse, even though it was likely an accident, not an attack. But sometimes stories matter more than truth. So the U.S. sends in troops to liberate the rebels fighting against their Spanish colonizers, promising them independence, not only in Cuba and Puerto Rico, but later over here in the Philippines and Guam. These local uprisings eventually drive out the Spanish. And in all of these cases, the U.S. reneges on their promise to give independence to these locals. And they Yeah, no, liberated, but like not really uh, at all, actually, not even remotely close. Figure out ways to govern Cuba and Puerto Rico indirectly themselves. The U.S. has just piggybacked off several independent movements to enact several coups at once, allowing them to install pro-American leaders and a navy base in Cuba, and eventually annexing Puerto Rico and Guam, which they still control, and the Philippines, which they held for 48 years. Again, I made a whole video about this one too if you want to go deeper. Anyway, we gotta move a little quicker here because we're not gonna get through all these coups. Let's move on. Okay, so we're over here in Nicaragua. <laughs> Liberated is a really funny way to describe the situation unfold. When you're talking about like almost identical styles of governance and continued enslavement and colonial uh, extraction of resources. So like how, what did you, what? I guess he said it sarcastically, right? He's saying like liberated and you can hear it saying like in air quotes. It's 1909. There's a bunch of powerful American companies here, but a new president comes to power vowing to regulate them. The U.S. is not going to let this happen. So the Secretary of State starts spreading rumors to smear this guy, this president, saying that he's building a canal that would compete with the Panama Canal. But really, they're just upset because Nicaragua is taking loans from Europe. The U.S. keeps painting this guy as a war criminal and someone worthy of being thrown out. Bro, that's so crazy. I mean, good thing we don't ever do that now. And, like, they don't even need to be good guys overall. Not many state leaders are. But, like, good thing we never do that now when we're, like, trying to implement regime change. You know what I mean? Like, it just, we would never do that now. Guys, stop. Stop saying Pepela. We never do that now. We are so different. So push comes to shove, and the U.S. sends ships to both of Nicaragua's coasts. They assemble a bunch of Marines in Panama. Basically just flex. No, you don't understand. Every single country, okay? Every single country that we happen to, uh, you know, be enemies with all are run by corrupt dictators, okay? And, and a very different style of governance than our government, which is like certainly not corrupt nor dictatorial. Okay? I hope you get that, please. It just happens to be that way. It's just a coincidence that like, all of the countries that we are actively trying to do regime change in, they're all the bad guys against us, the good guys. Scene on Nicaragua and telling the president to step down. And the benefit of being a rising... He labels anyone who's a social democrat as a communist Stalinist. Yeah, superpower. I mean, he is... is that it... This is a... This is like very... I would say... Like, I want to I be nice about this, but it does seem kind of malicious to... The rules based on international order make more sense when you realize U.S. interests are exempt when wanted. No, the rules-based international order is created so that it can be utilized against the United States enemies. It's not that the U.S. is exempt. It's that they were written specifically so that, you could, that it, they could be weaponized. But yeah, I want to be nice to Johnny, who makes like very piffy videos, very clever editing. Uh, they're catchy, they're entertaining, uh, and, and all that. But like... 
this is more insidious propaganda because it like on its face makes it seem like it's it's leftist critique against the CIA when in fact it's just literally like only talking about shit that the CIA recognizes and spinning it in a way that like the CIA also talks about like for example us giving stinger missiles to the mujahideen at the time was very openly done right but it was not considered to be like uh how do i describe it it was i mean we we gave weapons we gave weapons we funneled weapons into afghanistan okay and we celebrated that concept because they were anti-soviet uh rebels right they were anti-soviet rebels who just wanted to like free their country as ronald reagan said like the founding fathers right but of course when they became like when some of those mujahideens uh, then turned into uh, you know the taliban and numerous other groups like all of a sudden it was like oh well we did give them weapons but like we had to you know what i mean like there is always this whitewashing this acknowledgement of the things that uh, have been declassified or even celebrated like the Mujahideen were at the time. Um, Brave Mujahideen was never in Rambo. That's not what we're talking about, brother. I don't know why you keep fucking running with that line, okay? That's not, I it, like, it doesn't matter. Ronald Reagan did host them. That's not the point. Like, you're kind of spoiling the vid for the chat. My point is he's... These are... This video is is cut like it's anti- uh regime change but it's done in a way where it basically kind of legitimizes the the uh regime changes that happen do you see what i'm saying worked just he has no it. choice but to step down and soon a leader that the u.s likes comes to power the coup is complete and really this is the first of many instances of the u.s meddling in nicaragua a few years later the u.s is back in the region for another coup in next door honduras this one was plotted by a band of private American citizens, and it follows a similar pattern. A new president comes to town, in this case directly inspired by Nicaragua's president, and he wants to take back control of the country from American businesses. In this case, we're talking about bananas. The banana companies were not going to let this happen. And it was mostly this guy, a banana businessman named Sam the Banana Man. He's not going to let this pesky president run his country, no. So he assembles his own militia. He literally buys a surplus Navy ship, loads it up with weapons, and starts his campaign to get this president out. He's Shit was way cheaper back then, dude. You could just, like, <laughs> you could just, like, self-fund coup d'etats. Now the CIA is even incapable of, like, outsourcing it adequately in Venezuela, like what happened. Sails from New Orleans to the coast of Honduras, and he literally invades the country with, like, a private army. Wait, what, where's the U.S. government in all this? They also didn't like the political direction of Honduras either, so they just sort of stood back. Let this private invasion happen. And then oh. at the critical moment, the U.S. steps in to order a ceasefire, basically bullying the president to step down. He had no way forward, no defense, so he resigns. Yeah, they just stayed out of the way, huh? Where did they, how did they get uh, trained uh, infantrymen like that, I wonder? I mean, you can just always find them around weapons and, and also, uh, you know, Navy ships. It's, it's certainly like, it's just, you know, what were the casualty numbers looking like too? Wait, where's the mention of the thousand people slaughtered? I mean, dude, places to stage and train, just lying around surplus Navy equipment, lying around weapons, lying around, dude, you can, the U S government certainly was not involved in this until the last second when they just like kind of bullied, they kind of bullied, uh, the, the government and the banana man's leader of choice takes the presidency giving the banana businessman land and a unique status to import anything he needs tax-free. And, wait for it, he refunds him for all of the coup expenses using public Honduran money. This banana man literally overthrew the government and made Honduras pay for it. Wow. Okay, so let's move forward to the 50s, where the coup be- I love you, but you're being so incredibly uncharitable. This is a live video, but for Nor Normie, this video becomes a more American useful actions. tool in the American toolkit. I the mean, what you just- what he just said is directly a coup d'etat that is admitted to, uh, that he says the American government had, like, very little involvement in until, like, forcing a ceasefire. That's fucking bullshit. There's this new U.S. agency dedicated to collecting and analyzing information from all over the world, meaning for spying. 
They call it the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, and it completely revolutionizes the art of the coup. Oh, and at this point, the US is now a full-blown global superpower, no longer just looking in their own neighborhood, but rather at the whole world map, investing huge resources into fighting their global rival and its communist ideology. So this simultaneously greatly exaggerating the influence, scope, activities, uh, and involvements of the USSR in an effort to boost their, uh, you know, boost their need, you know? Because, like, if there's no demand for it, you just got to make it up. You got to be like, dude, it's going crazy out there. They're doing mind control. They're spying on everybody. While simultaneously uh, uh, constantly talking about how starving and how starved the population is. And also actively recognizing that they were not starved at all and actually had like, uh, you know, a higher calor calorie diet than the American citizen at the time. But it's like literally everything and anything you've heard about the USSR has been filtered through CIA propaganda and Red Scare propaganda. This gets us to Iran, 1953, where Iran had okay, just elected a new Iran. star politician, Mohammad Mossadegh. He rises to power believing that Iran must take back control of its most valuable natural resource, oil, which at the time was completely controlled by a British company called the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. We know it today as BP. Mossadegh is done with this. Let's kick the British out and take back our oil. But like the US, Britain is not happy with Iranians trying to take back their resources. So they warn that if they do this, there will be consequences. Okay, facts. So the British catch a quick meeting with the CIA's Middle East guy who was passing through London, and they pitch him on this idea. Let's throw out Mossadegh. The CIA's like, okay, and they kind of sniff communist vibes on Mossadegh with this big desire to nationalize Iran's oil, or at least they tell themselves they do. So the CIA agrees, and they secretly send this guy to Iran. He's the Middle East bureau chief, Kermit Roosevelt. He's like in his 30s. Oh, and yes, he is the grandson of another big- By the way, Mohammad Mossadegh, is like a communist only because he wanted to nationalize the oil industry, okay? But of course you can't do that because, but then you're, you're hurting British petroleum profit margins. Like those are British petroleum refineries that you're using. We, we built those because we thought that we could just like keep stealing your oil and not giving you anything in return. It's not like, it, I, I wouldn't say he's like communist in any meaningful capacity, okay? Coup guy, Teddy Roosevelt, who I have gone into in other videos. Roosevelt sneaks into Iran and is given a million taxpayer dollars to use, quote, in any way that would bring about the fall of Mossadegh. So now there's American CIA agents in Iran secretly trying to overthrow the government. And it's a rocky start at first with a bunch of failures, but they start using their money to get traction, bribing politicians, religious clerics, and other leaders to say divisive and controversial things about Mossadegh. They hire locals to stage attacks against religious leaders, making it look like they had been ordered to do so by Mossadegh. But really, they were just getting paid by the CIA to do this. And with enough time and money, they create an atmosphere of chaos and hostility and distrust among the public. Oh, and there's weapons. The CIA stashes enough weapons and explosives to support a, quote, 10,000-man guerrilla organization for six months. Like, just in case they need to, like, start a full... Yeah, bro, that kind of stuff certainly doesn't happen anymore. Like, no color revolutions or anything like that. This is part of the reason why a lot of people... I'll just say it like this. There's a reason why a lot of people... There's a reason why I famously always say... Like if you are if you have anti-American sentiment when talking about like ninety eight percent of uh, history and also uh, whatever is going on in the world, you're gonna be you're gonna be right ninety eight percent of the time. You know what I mean? But the two percent of time, you're not accounting like genuine ang uh, animosity on the ground. But like you're gonna be right ninety eight percent of the time. Okay. Now of course those two percent, they'll never let you live it down. They will never let you fucking shut the fuck up about that. They will never let you go. Oh yeah, my bad, I was wrong about that. But they, but it makes total sense because they used to do this shit and they still do this shit. For the record, full on conflict. The result of all of this is more violence and chaos that engulfs the capital. Shops are being destroyed, bullets are flying into mosques, people are beaten, and thousands of paid demonstrators flood the street the city falls into anarchy, all of it orchestrated by CIA money. And in the end, this all results in a bloody shootout at Mossadegh's house. He eventually gives up and turns himself in, 
He's put through a sham trial and found guilty of treason and sentenced to three years in solitary confinement and then house arrest, where he stayed until his death. The previous ruler of Iran, Mohammad Reza Shah, which just means king, had fled the country. But now, with the democratically elected Mossadegh gone, and with the backing of the US and UK, he could charter a flight back into Iran and take control. The Shah crowns himself in a tradition which goes back 25 centuries. His title is King of Kings, and he becomes Emperor of his nation. While this is happening, the United States is doing this everywhere around the world, some unsuccessfully and some successfully, most of which is not being mentioned in this video. So if you're asking me, like, where is it happening right now? Like, can you give me an example? Literally everywhere, okay? That does not change the reality that there might be on the ground legitimate resentment. That does not change the reality that some of the people might foolishly believe that, like, America has their best interests in heart. Kurdish people being one of the primary examples of this, even though uh, Kurdish people at this stage perfectly recognize that they are just being utilized as a militia force and they are more valuable to U.S. State Department interests as like a roving uh, uh, a band of, of different militias that fight America's battles in the Middle East. Um, but everywhere, literally everywhere, everywhere, everywhere that you see uh, some level of like, um, like everywhere where there is uh, uh, any kind of, of political movement, whether it be uh, African nations, whether it be in Asia, whether it be in the Middle East, America has at least some of its tentacles involved. The U.S. really came out on top here. They got what they wanted. They now have an American-friendly dictator in a powerful country in the Middle East who is now welcoming American oil companies to get in on one of the largest oil reserves on Earth. Like, that's why, for example, Juan Guaido, you might not like Maduro, okay? Maduro, you might not like him. You might uh, not consider him to be a good leader. But Juan Guaido, the first thing he tried to do to utilize way above the, the rights and responsibility that the fucking Constitution had afforded him as like a potential interim period of presidency, immediately talked about privatizing oil refineries. Why? Why? Like, is that the, the most pressing matter? Is that, is that what the Venezuelan people are yearning for? They're yearning for freedom by, uh, you know, privatizing their oil refineries. That's, that's what it was. No, that's, it's the same shit. They do it all the time. They do it nonstop. Earth. Under the Shah, Iran becomes a brutal police state. He executed military officers, student leaders, anyone associated with Mossadegh. He set up a secret police force and life was brutal. So brutal that in 1979, the frustration of Iranians burst forth in mass protests that ran the Shah out of office and replaced him with an inspiring new leader who would turn Iran into an Islamic Republic built in part off a foundation of resentment for the U.S. having meddled in their country. I mean, this is 100%. This is what I talk about. I mean, it's like reductive, but this is what I mean. When I talk about like all of these Middle Eastern countries that you look at and you're like, what the fuck? They're living in a different time period. It's like, that wasn't the case for literally all of these countries, okay? The only reason why Turkey, well, I guess Turkey now is a little bit different, but the only reason why Turkey did not get impacted in a similar way was because it was a part of NATO and was, it was allowed the United States to put fucking missile bases directed at the USSR. And even internally in Turkey, we had a fucking cold war of our own. That literally, that happened. That happened internally in Turkey too. Why the fuck were the Turkish communists, the Turkish ultranationals fighting against one another? Do you care to, do you, do you understand which side uh, the, the uh, Turkish ultranationalists, who was being armed? In that, in that fight? Or who inevitably won, I guess? The United States of America, of course, was funding, arming, training, and allowing the ultranationalist Grey Wolves to operate. They did this in the entirety of Europe, too. One of the most famous instances being Gladio. They did it through NATO. It, for our allies, for our allies, we did it through NATO. For our enemies, we did it in ways like this. Okay. The Islamic Republic has held power ever since and has morphed into the oppressive theocracy we know today, though maybe not for long. Like, why was there no network internally? Do you think the... Do you think the Iranian 
uh, population had no communists, had no revolutionary forces within it? Or were they eradicated successfully? Because time and time again, America always considered fascist reactionaries to be valuable allies, especially in the fight against communist revolutionaries, which they saw to be the real threat. Because communist revolutionaries, whenever they took power, would do shit like nationalize the oil industry, would do things that would undermine the authority that the IMF and the World Bank was trying to create on the third world. The USSR was a flawed and perfect nation, but imagine how much, how more unsafe the third world would have been in the second half of the 20th had the USSR not existed to be a counterbalance, a force to put America in its place whenever America wanted to swing its big dick across the third world domestic politics. Yeah, I mean, literally. A lot of Americans look to the Cold War era and think like a, a multipolar world was devastating and terrifying. Yeah, it was. It was literally devastating and terrifying because the top of the hour ad break was here and no one was subscribed for $5 or for free with a Twitch Prime. Think about a future like that where top of the hour ad breaks come and no one is subscribed. There's no gifted subs. There's no $5 a month subscription. There's no free one in the form of a Twitch Prime. And you're just sitting there watching three-minute ad breaks at the top of every hour. Terrifying proposition. Here's a three-minute ad break now. <laughs> anyway, no, what I was going to say is, yeah, the world was terrifying and incredibly violent when, it, when uh, these two warring nations were constantly dick-swinging, but only made more terrifying because America kept arming fucking fascists who would do gruesome atrocities in the name of anti-communist action. You know, not dissimilar to Nazi Germany, if you want to think about it, like, domestically, you know? Capital owners sided with fascists in the lead-up to World War II because they saw fascism as an adequate mechanism of control. They saw fascism... They saw, on the one hand, revolutionary action growing through trade unionists, communists alike, socialists, and they saw fascists that promised control over that uh, through violent means, and they chose their guy. America literally took that and basically made it global. They were like, that's a fucking, that's fire. We're going to keep doing that. That's the best. That's why I always say we are the villains of the world. Oh, shit. This person basically said exactly that. Nazi Germany and the fascist movement of the 30s could be looked at as a global bourgeois experiment in how best to apply colonial tactics to Western domestic populations. British colonialism, which had captured at least half the earth, immediately collapsed after World War II, replacing it with USCN neocolonialism, a sort of hybrid colonialism with liberal democratic aesthetics. The Anglo bourgeois had learned a lesson. The old civilizing mission of colonizers was no longer effective propaganda. The new rhetoric, new logic for colonization had to be created. This led to the advent of the World Bank, IMF imperialism via Bretton Woods. This hybridizing of colonialism has reflected a similar evolution of Western domestic policy. Western nations now regularly employ colonial and neocolonial tactics on their own populations. Yup. But with a consistent liberal democratic veneer couched in the logic of the free market. The U.S. exemplifies this best, being foremost uh, leader in shaping how nations organize themselves post-World War II. Fascist violence and repression is largely reserved for internal colonies and those poor enough to be associated with them, while the democratic veneer prevails as a moral signpost. The U.S. police can kill 1,000 a year. U.S. can have the largest prison population per capita. U.S. prisons can use slave labor, which is true, by the way. This is, all of this is true. U.S. can even support fascism in other nations. But so long as the bourgeois and the petty bourgeois can vote, it's not explicitly a fascist nation. U.S. intelligence can mass surveil, can employ violent and covert tactics on civilians. The government can execute the innocent, harbor political prisoners, deliberately poison and render more vulnerable citizens destitute, yet still not be labeled authoritarian, dictatorial, or fascist. That's why I always say the only difference between like theocratic monarchies and imperialist violence that they engaged in versus the capitalist neoliberal hegemonic order that we exist under now is basically the lie of meritocracy. Back then, the justification for these kingdoms was that God allowed my lordship to stay in power. But now, 
A lot of people don't fuck with that God narrative. They're like, eh, I don't know about this God shit. So what do they believe in? What do they worship? The altar of capitalism. It is the exact same dogmatic belief structure that is still very much ingrained in the medieval peasant minds of our current population. Okay? Well, it's meritocracy. These guys deserve it. They worked really hard. They worked really smart. You know, Elon Musk deserves all the wealth. Jeff Bezos deserves all the wealth. And then what do we have? The profit, the profits that these capital owners create, then design the system and create the institutions to then reinforce that cycle of violence and basically normalize it. So you don't even think about it. You're like, what? There's no alternative system. The alternative system is USSR. Everyone's dying in fucking bread lines. Holy shit. Meanwhile, we have bread lines here, motherfucker. Bread lines means the government is at least offering food. You don't even get bread lines in America. You literally stand in line to buy the bread. <laughs> anyway. <sighs> this was a key lesson taken from the Nazi experiment. You can repress, but you can't revel in it. The repression must be a means, not an end. Hence, this is the problem the bourgeoisie have with Trump. He makes it impossible for the U.S. to continue to perpetuate its moral facade. The Nazis and fascists reveled in their superiority. They openly bragged about how stupid they thought democracy is. This ultimately contributed to their undoing, as the Western bourgeoisie could no longer support them and maintain its ethical posture, their perceived support, superiority. I think that, that this uh, kind of falls apart a little bit here. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with this part. Um, I think, I think fascism and the internal contradictions accelerated within fascism is part of the reason why it, it falls apart. And neoliberalism is an infinitely better mechanism of control because, you, you know, it does give you this false sense of security and this false sense of freedom, this false sense of choice. But certainly I think, uh, fascism was always destined to fail because, Again, you always are are eradicating uh, points of the population. There's no end point to fascism. It's a it's a self defeating uh, concept because you know what did Hitler want to move towards? He wanted to move towards the Ubermensch, right? So if it wasn't just like the Roma people, uh, the Jews, the trade unionists, the communists that were being eviscerated in labor camps, being murdered, um, he and and the disabled population he was ultimately going to then move to uh calling the next round of the volk ultimately until he arrived at the the uh eugenics uh project of of the ubermensch so that's like always going to be a a, a self-sucking self-destroying system a self-destroying structure what is the faustini saying neoliberal and american unipo unipolar power also led to the greatest decrease in global poverty uh yeah it shouts out to china for that i think and the largest redistribution of wealth from the west to the east under its unipolar world order but all bad also thank you russia for bringing us back together uh again you are you are taking you are faustini anti-china if i'm not mistaken unless you're like the michael bloomberg type liberal uh neoliberal and you are now again basically fucking you're you're literally taking on the accomplishments of china and even the ussr depending on how far back you're going no, nah, China isn't a threat. Okay. So you are a Michael Bloomberg style uh, China supporter. Austerity is one example of this evolution being the economic logic of neocolonialism applied domestically. The U.S. bases its necessity on the movements of the free market. Use of covert action against subversives, i.e. bringing Phoenix program tactics to L.A., is another colonial logic turned neocolonial that ended up becoming domestic policy as well. The Phoenix program itself seemed to be inspired by certain British acts of colonial repression. Evidence points to the Phoenix borrowing from the British Malaya emergency as well as their response to the Kenyan Mau Mau rebe rebellion. Similar tactics would infamously be used to subvert the black power movement. Block Faustini for your own mental health. Goddamn. What? No, nah, China isn't a threat. Aging population. Okay. How do you avoid mentioning Polish people in the Hitler argument? Man... I didn't do it deliberately. God damn, I forgot the Polish for one second. Holy shit, dude. There are other groups that I forgot as well. Okay, calm down. He, he, had, he hated a lot of people. <laughs> Christ. Okay, let's get back to this video that I forgot to, that we were watching. 
Before we go on, a quick reminder that all of these coups, these plans to overthrow leaders in other countries, did not require American votes or consensus or approval of Congress. It was usually just a few key men in government buildings in Washington, D.C. making this happen. These people would go on to define the Cold War and shape so many... No, I don't agree with that either. Like, no, I don't think it's like... No. No, it's not like a couple people, dude. What the fuck? This is a collection of interests that they are, that they are managing and defending. And I would go so far as to say that the reason why they're in that position is because they're defending those interests. It's the same as like in manufacturing consent. Who rises to the top? Who rises to the top in the media? It's a it's a self it's a self-selecting pool of individuals that inevitably cuts those who are going against the grain who will then speak out against uh, their their speak out against the unjustifiable constructs. Like that's how it always works. It's not just like a couple guys acting out on their own desires. It's usually people that were elevated to that position because they are the the at the time the best person to to advocate for the desires of the bourgeois capital owning class. Any covert operations around the world that many of which we'll never know about. Okay, let's keep going. The next year in Guatemala, the CIA tried to pull the same playbook that they used in Iran. Once again, targeting a leader that the people had elected, but who wanted to take back the country's resources for the people. To break up these American monopolies that controlled the country's electricity and railroad. That's the president so even up. starts to seize land from one massive banana company. It was often unused land that he wanted to redistribute to the locals who could farm it and feed their families. And How dare, dude, well, fuck this guy. I mean, I'm already, I'm already, mm, I don't like that. And hopefully climb out of the system of endemic poverty in the country. Once again, I made a whole video on this, the geopolitics of bananas in Central America. But the fact is that the U.S. decided that they had to defend the banana companies, or else more communist reforms would spread. So the U.S. President and Secretary of State ordered an overthrow, and the CIA got right to work. The CIA hand selects a leader that they want to be in power. And then they start giving equipment and training to a bunch of Guatemalan exiles. By the way, again, like, I... I... I don't think I okay. I'll I'll say this much, okay. Remember what I remember what I used to always say. It's literally basic social democratic moves that a lot of these nations are making, and it's it's the way to look at it is like that Family Guy, uh, that Family Guy color blotter. You know what I mean? It's like it's social democracy, and it's fine if it's a white European nation. It's completely a no-no if it's a brown, Latin American, South American, Central American, or, uh, you know, African or, or uh, Middle Eastern nation. Then it's like, it's communism. It can't be happening. We need to stop it. Like, literally, these were nations that were, that were prevented from I I emancipation, from, prevented from utilizing their own natural, their, their, own natu ah! their own natural resources every single time and private soldiers. They set up a secret operation base on the outskirts of Miami. They start delivering weapons to the Panama Canal. But like the other coups, it can't just all be about weapons. They gotta own the information space. So they create a radio station that sounds like it's a local Guatemalan radio station, but really it's being operated out of a small town in Florida. And they start publishing fake news about an uprising, unrest, a rebellion. And then at the same time, the fighters that the CIA had trained and armed invades Guatemala. Pilots start dropping bombs on fuel tanks and military posts and airports, but they weren't starting a full-on war. I also want to mention one other thing. For, for everybody who is like looking at this and seeing that like the tactics have never changed and it's almost identical, this is literally the reason why a lot of countries that are not inside of the Western hegemonic power structure as like aligned nations have such rigorous information control okay they saw this happen over and over again this still is they still try to implement this in cuba regularly okay but that is also part of the reason why a lot of these countries including cuba including china do such rigorous information control and do not allow dissemination of information in their countries that is not completely fucking uh you know checked by the government 
this is this is happening everywhere. Obviously, when our allies, when our aligned nations are doing it, they're doing it at their own behest because they're capitalists, they're allies. But that is precisely the reason why information control happens in these countries. I don't like it. I literally, I live in America. I like the the freedom of information here. I like the, the supposed freedoms for the most part. But like, I like the, the liberty that I have, right? But I certainly understand why other countries are more authoritarian when they are not completely inside of the the bosom of America, okay? The when they're completely when they're outside of it, they have to engage in this because they don't want to fucking have coup d'etats. But the irony of course is that America will then look at that, point to it and go, "Look at how authoritarian these countries are." And they are authoritarian, okay? Dude, literally can't say a good thing about America without a backhand dig law. I mean, dude, what what do you Whose channel are you on, brother? When America was at war, we implemented the Espionage Act, okay? We were fucking ruthless. We literally built concentration camps for Japanese people that were living here. Do you understand? So don't talk to me about fucking Cuba or China or any of these other fucking places when, you know, uh, and, and how authoritarian they are because they're constantly fucking, you know, under threat, under legitimate threat. Maybe not China as much, uh, especially because, like, the, the economic power that they have is, is, is massive. But as far as, like, authoritarian means of controlling information, yeah, that's, like, that's going to happen. They weren't trying to cause real damage. They wanted it to feel like a domestic uprising, like a war was on the horizon to freak people out. And for many, it totally worked. They thought that this was a real uprising and had no idea that the CIA was behind it all. But the president knew what was up. He had messed with the USA and now he's hearing about it. Military leaders in his circle are feeling the pressure from the big bully from the north and they turn on him and he eventually surrenders. On his way out, the president addresses his people, makes it very clear that, quote, the United Fruit Company, in collaboration with the United States, is responsible for what is happening to us. And just like that, one president is out and the hand-picked CIA option is in. This new regime is brutal and goes on to do horrible things. Detaining people they thought were communists, killing prisoners. They did all this shit while also the environmental degradation they caused was also vast too. Remember that, like, it was insane. They were just like fucking, they, they were just like ripping forests apart. When we talk about like, currently we talk about fucking what uh, Bolsonaro did in the rainforest in Brazil and we're like, oh, that's a big no-no, what are you doing? Meanwhile, we did that everywhere, okay, everywhere. Breaking up labor unions and in the process, restoring the banana company's land and ensuring that they may- Yeah, also Johnny is like definitely, uh, you know, laying this on- super gently uh when he says detaining people that they thought were communists it's like no you're just like fucking murdering farmers dude that's all you were doing and goes on to do horrible things detaining people they thought were communists killing prisoners breaking up labor unions and in the process restoring the banana company's land and ensuring that they maintained their hold on this economy this kicks off an era in guatemala of more political assassinations and instability something that still plagues the country today. And yet to this day, there is no evidence that the Soviets were ever slightly interested in Guatemala. Communism was once again the excuse, but really this was about securing American business interests, tearing a country apart for bananas. Bananas taste the best and are the best for you. All right, let's go to Africa. So it's 1960 here in the center of Africa, a country called Congo. By the way, Arbenz was never, like, officially aligned with communist uh, thought or was a communist in any capacity. He was just a social democrat. Remember, in a lot of instances, these guys, in a lot of instances, what these people always do is just basically, because, like, communism is a big no-no, and uh, they're, they're just basically saying, like, oh, these guys are communists. Go in and do whatever the fuck you want. Um... And for those of you who are wondering, like, when we do stuff like this, right? When we do stuff like this, the impact that we leave behind is what leads to massive, uh, massive amounts of immigrants because of the, the economic turmoil, okay? 
Like, whenever people talk about immigration being, like, a huge issue or whatever in America, people refuse to recognize America's impact. The reason why people want to leave, like, I'll tell it to you like this, okay? Chatters. You grew up in your hometown. Your friends and your family live there. Why the fuck would you ever, like, leave your hometown if you didn't have to? I mean, some people have, like, big dreams. They want to go to the city, yada, yada. That's not what I'm talking about. You never, you never want to, like, leave your friends and family and your culture behind to go somewhere else that doesn't even understand your language that is going to treat you like a fucking outsider that you can't even, like, legally enter half the fucking time. You do that because you're literally forced to. Why are you forced? Because the economic devastation that we brought about is the leading cause for the instability in these countries and the lack of opportunities in those countries. We go there, we build a couple railroads so we can like more efficiently fucking process their natural resources. We give none of them the fucking profits, okay? We give the, the, the nation none of it back. We rob them fucking blind. That's why people always say Africa as a continent is not a poor continent. As a matter of fact, Africa's biggest fault was it's a very rich continent, okay? With vast riches. The problem is those vast riches were robbed, that's the issue. We pillage them. And we continue pillaging them. Yeah, I know. Yellow parenti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. I, I should fucking... I should throw uh, a Juniper style or an Austinox style fucking... I should throw Austinox style fucking uh, subway surfers alongside what I'm saying so people can focus on what I'm saying. A lot of the leaders in America cooed were social democrats for sure, but why did America allow for social democracies to thrive in Europe but not anywhere in the world? Because they already had a stranglehold through the Marshall Plan and, and uh, post-World War II development through NATO. They already, that was, they, they already have full control. They were white. They had full control over these countries. You know, they were, they, that was fine. They were allowed. They did, by the way, they also did that in Europe too. They did not allow social democracies to thrive in Europe. They literally killed trade unionists in Europe too. It's just, they only, they, they killed social democrats or stopped social democrats in European nations as well. And then once neoliberals were in power or like right-wing institutions were in power, they were like, all right, we're good now. Yeah, Swedish prime minister is a good example of this. Italy is a great example of this. Greece is another example of this. Um, so the idea that like America didn't do this exact same shit in in you know maybe they didn't do it in the same like overt and like glaringly obvious and very violent ways even though there was a lot of terrorism okay there was a lot of terrorism um but they they very effectively dismantled socialist movements in western europe as well some some by way of economic development right aiding the restoration of Western Europe and some by way of, you know, straight up fucking murdering all of the anti-fascists. <laughs> they just gained independence from Belgium and they have an election. And this guy, Patrice Lumumba, wins, becomes the prime minister. But immediately over in Washington, the communist alarm bells instantly start sounding off because we're in the middle of the Cold War. And Congo is a place full of tons of natural resources, including loads of uranium, the main ingredient for nuclear bombs. This is at a time when Americans are keeping gas masks next to their bed and have hordes of canned goods in their basements. And officials in Washington- A lot of this was also, again, like what he just uh, explained, as far as like the fear of uh, all out like nuclear warfare, nuclear holocaust, that kind of thing, was pretty much uh, legitimately uh, it was also agitated propaganda. It was basically, not agitated propaganda, but it was just propaganda that, like, you know, they had a lot of, uh, you know, the USSR had a lot of weapons. There was a missile gap. They have too much. They can fucking destroy us on a moment's uh, notice. Like, things that you're seeing, things that you are uh, seeing even now with, like, slowly but surely, subtly describing how much of a, you know, looming threat China is with its balloon gap or, you know, the, uh, the, the increasing like agitation, uh, between the United States and China, 
all of that is is super super old school cold war propaganda against the ussr it, they they never america rarely ever updates its model they just kind of do the exact same thing over and over again because it's like if it ain't broke don't fix it right well it doesn't really work that well uh lately but you know Washington can't risk Congo falling into the influence of the Soviet Union. So they start focusing on this prime minister. The CIA director called him, quote, an urgent and prime objective that should, quote, be a high priority of our covert action. So they pull a more political coup than the ones before. They start allying with Lumumba's political enemies and Congo's former colonizer, Belgium. They bribe politicians, they fund protests and labor movements, and they circulate propaganda, similar ingredients to the previous coups. And when the moment is right, all these bribed politicians do what the CIA asked them to. They remove Lumumba from power. And the CIA is right there giving money and intelligence and advice to the new government. This political solution was actually not the first try. The CIA had tried to assassinate Lumumba in the past, but all of those attempts failed, which is why they turned to hijacking and manipulating Congolese politics, a brand new democracy, supporting the people who would eventually go on to put Lumumba in front of a Congolese and Belgian firing squad, making this effectively a political assassination supported from an ocean away. And yet there's so much gray area in these coups. In this case, it's really tough to prove that the CIA's support was the key factor factor in Lumumba's assassination. It's debated to this day. An effective foreign-sponsored coup works like this. Operating in the shadows, fueling divisions, that? appealing to I don't the understand. If you, like, recognize it, then why do you... Dude, this is the second time he's done this. Um, Where it's like... It's not... Why is this debatable? Like... It, it, you facilitate the removal of of uh, you facilitate the ousting, and then he, the the execution comes along with that. Like, what what do you mean? It, what what the fuck is that? It's like, wait, is he gonna is he gonna talk about uh is he gonna talk about Gaddafi in this or no? Like, does he does he say that like oh well who knows what happened to Gaddafi? Or if it's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard to determine why Gaddafi, uh, or if the U.S. was involved in the in the assassination of Gaddafi, the worst demons of the people on the ground, through money, through influence. All right, let's move on to the Caribbean in the 1960s. Like. There's a brutal dictator here in the Dominican Republic. I mean, this guy's really bad. He's rumored to feed his opponents to sharks. But anyway, what the US cares about is that there's fear that a communist revolution could happen at any moment. So the CIA sends weapons to a group of hitmen who go assassinate this guy. It ends up being an ambush and a car chase. They're successful in taking him out, ending his 31 year rule. And eventually the US sends in forces to occupy the DR to make sure that a leftist candidate doesn't come to power. They restore order, and eventually a U.S.-friendly candidate is elected. It's, it's like the meme where it's like, it, it, it's like the meme of, uh, you know, oh, socialism never works, which is why like, uh, socialism never works, uh, you know, when we involve ourselves with it. I always say the same thing. It's like if socialism doesn't work, if it's like a fucking absolute failure, if it's, an, if it's, an genuine, if it's a genuine failure, why don't you just allow it to fail? Why do you always have to like uh you know do everything in your fucking power to to physically rip people for not even doing socialism by the way but just like socialization literacy programs nationalization of like certain key sectors you know liberties allowed uh that liberties that were given to to uh western european nations elected Okay, so now we have to head over to Vietnam in 1963. And boy, this is a way bigger one than we have time for, but we're trying to focus on the coup element of this. Vietnam was divided in two, between communist and pro-Western governments. The US needs the South to stay on their side, but Washington starts to lose confidence in this guy, the South's leader. He's losing a grip on the country, and the US fears that communism will take over the whole country of Vietnam. So the CIA rolls up its sleeves. It's time for another coup. This time they focus on a South Vietnamese- Oh, I forgot to mention one other thing. When we were talking about Europe, you actually posed a really interesting question in the chat. You were like, why was Europe allowed to have some of these like social democracies? 
I think another reason was proximity, other than like them being white nations overall, their proximity to the USSR played a key role here. I think that America wasn't as like aggressive uh, in the in the immediate aftermath of World War II uh, with respect to like immediately implementing uh, with the re- with respect to like implementing uh, uh, coups in the same way that they're doing this. And the USSR being the big, bad, scary guy wasn't actually a big, bad, scary guy because of its, like, weapons. It was a big, bad, scary guy because there were plenty of fucking communists that were still in these countries. And if America started openly fucking doing the same shit that they were doing in, like, all these other nations, uh, they, they were worried that people would look to and could, could very quickly get help from the USSR. These uh, trade unionists and and communists and and socialists alike, I think that was part of the reason why they were allowed basically to have more social democratic uh, liberties. And some of them were longstanding too. You know what I mean? Like welfare systems that were uh, that welfare systems that were in in uh, that were experimented on even before uh, World War II. You know what I mean? Like they were just expanding on uh, pre existing structures. And I think that's uh, part of the other thing too. Wait, is he saying the U.S.? It was just the Congolese that were greedy and got tricked by the Americans. It's odd that he's not talking about this as an extension of colonialism. He really skimmed over the Belgian involvement in the Congo and didn't even mention the French in Vietnam. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. I was gonna me- I was gonna mention that with France. He said like South Vietnam is backed by Americans and North Vietnam is is uh, USSR. And it's like what happened before that is you know kind of important. I think. Um. This is, this is a nation that was like fighting against uh, colonial superpowers. Anyway, I'm going to roll this back real quick. We have to head over to Vietnam in 1963. Like one thing I mentioned, sometimes people get mad, but like Ho Chi Minh was, uh, was, was fond of the founding fathers, Uncle Ho. He saw his battle of emancipation uh, uh, not dissimilar to the founding fathers against uh, uh, England. Like he literally, he, 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 in a different world, I mean, obviously it wouldn't have, it would not have happened, but different world, who knows? Who knows what could have happened? He wasn't a marabou though. And boy, this is a way bigger one than we have time for, but we're trying to you focus on the shit, true element dude? of this. Wait, what? Vietnam was divided in two between communists and pro-Western government. What, you think I'm lying? The U.S. needs the South to stay on their side. But Washington starts to lose confidence in this guy, the South's leader. He's losing a grip on the country. And the U.S. fears that communism will take over the whole country of Vietnam. So the CIA rolls up its sleeves. It's time for another coup. This time they focus on a South Vietnamese general who also doesn't love the president. And he agrees to do the CIA's bidding. And when given the signal, the general directs his military to seize the airport and radio stations. And they block off highways. They march to the presidential palace a bloody shootout goes down and this president president dm escapes he happens to be with his brother but it's not going well for them so he realizes that he needs to set up a meeting to surrender they're going to meet at a catholic church this was probably going to be a peaceful meeting but when the generals arrive they just kill him on the spot it's crazy saying quote to kill the weed you must pull up the roots meaning in order to solve the problem dm must die exile was not enough. Now, the U.S. actually didn't plan for this to happen. They didn't want to kill this guy. It was not an official order from Washington. But they made this coup happen. JFK is said to be really distraught about this. The first American Catholic president behind the coup that killed the first Vietnamese Catholic president. And incidentally, JFK was assassinated 20 days later. And one national security journalist argues that Diem's assassin... <laughs> <laughs> Who knows how that happened? We still don't know, you know? The nation actually had a greater impact on American history than the murder of JFK because it locked the U.S. into a decade of conflict in Vietnam, which ballooned into a long war. Locked the U.S. into a decade of conflict in Vietnam? Like we were forced, our hand was forced into going into Vietnam? Bro, Republicans don't say this in 2023. Okay, like, no, I'm not even, I'm taking it one step further. You, like, almost objectively, everyone says, like, okay, we fucking should not have done that. We should not have gotten involved. Republicans don't think that. 
That's crazy. Yeah, we were so locked that we just kept sending, um, you know, official American trainers into the field of battle who just got shot, and then we had no other uh, option, you know what I mean? Or our ships that kept uh, getting shot at off the coastal line. It's just like, who knows how it happened, you know? We just got locked into it, I guess. That's a, that's, okay, that's like a, that's a wild, wild, wild way to uh, explain this. ...into a decade history than the murder of JFK, because it locked the U.S. into a decade... No, he's not quoting someone, he's saying that himself. ...decade of conflict in Vietnam, which ballooned into a long war, ending in an embarrassing defeat and a political crisis at home. One of yeah, that was the most embarrassing part of uh, our experiences in Vietnam. Not the fact that we deployed in a ton of munitions, uh, napalm, and and numerous other horrifying things that we did. Not even in like North Vietnam, but in South Vietnam, where like the majority of the bombings took place. Like, he's not even, I, I assume he's not even going to talk about Cambodia. Like, there's so much here. There, there, what? <laughs> He's just like skipping over, uh, you know, an atrocity that was so devastating that like an atrocity that was so devastating that it still has a, a permanent impact with a bunch of Vietnamese babies that are still being born with like birth defects. I was actually, fuck, was it NPR? Who was talking about this the other day? South Korea was also involved in Vietnam. And the, I think the first ever uh, uh, payment for South Korean war crimes, uh, uh, like, a, like a court case, uh, there was a decision for the first time on, a, on like a, a South Korean military member engaging in war crimes against the civilian population. And what I found to be particularly strange about this, hold on, I'm going to give you guys the details here, okay? Because insane... Yeah, here it is. In a first ever, South Korea was ordered to compensate Vietnam War victim, right? This just happened. As a part of the ruling, Judge Park Jin Su of the Seoul Central District Court ordered the government to pay win $23,900 in compensation, saying what members of the 2nd Marine Brigade of South Korea did to her family clearly amounted to an illegal act. Now, what they did was, uh, you know, just wanton violence uh, and, and murder, uh, a gravely wounding, uh, win, uh, hold on, Win T. Tan, 62, sued the South Korean government in 2020, saying that she lost five relatives and she and her brother were gravely wounded when South Korean Marines swept through Pong Ni and Pong Nut villages in central Vietnam on February 12, 1968, killing more than 70 villagers. Do you know what is interesting about that date? So this is, this is a very interesting date. I want you to pay attention to it. February 12th, 1968, where the South Korean government acknowledged its atrocities against uh, villagers is only one month removed from one of the most notorious massacres that the United States military engaged in. The My Lai Massacre. On March 16th in 1968, a platoon of American soldiers killed as many as 500 unarmed citizens in My Lai, one of a cluster of small villages located near the northern coast of South Vietnam. The crime was kept a secret nearly two years and later was, it later became known as the My Lai Massacre. So just remember that. And by the way, the thing about my lie is that it is not unique. This was super, super commonplace. So the, I, the notion, the notion that like Vietnam was really long and complicated and we were forced into doing this thing. And, uh, you know, it was just really bad because it had like a lot of political ramifications in the United States of America is insane to me like no matter what happens 
no matter no matter what happens the, the to glance over this history is insane like just to not even to, to, to brush past it one of the few coups where the u.s actually had to deal with the aftermath okay let's blast through a few of these really quickly I'm gonna skirt over some details here. It's 1964 and Brazil is potentially veering off into communism with the rise of a new leftist leader. Lucky for the CIA, there's already a coup being plotted against him. So the US military just shows up with ships off the coast of Brazil. They airlift in a bunch of ammunition and supplies. They didn't end up having to do much actually. Instead, they just stood by with reinforcements and watched the Brazilian coup go down. The leftist leader goes down and a new leader comes in. In 1973, there's a coup in Chile that is a very complicated story with conflicting accounts and we went down a super deep rabbit hole and we've decided that because the evidence is not rock solid, we're going to cut it for time. Bro, what? There's no way. Dude. Okay. By his own metrics. By his own metrics of like what constitutes a coup d'etat. The fact that he just avoided talking about Chile is insane to me. Because there are other involvements that he mentioned that have the exact, maybe not even as much evidence as U.S. involvement in Chile. Like... He talked about Honduras and Guatemala that I would say Chile constitutes the exact, if, if we're, if we use the exact same fucking metrics of what is declared a coup d'etat, Chile absolutely is a, a U.S. CIA backed coup d'etat. There is extensive documentation on it. Like, it's not like a, it, it's not like a, Oh man, this is like really confusing. Who knows what happened? I mean, here, there's also this. Um, in 2000, September 20th, 2000, the CIA acknowledged for the first time its extent of its deep involvement in Chile where it dealt with coup plotters, false propagandists, and assassins. The agency planned to post a declassified report required by Congress on its website today that admits the CIA support for the 1970s kidnapping of Chile's top general for refusing to use the army to prevent the country's Congress from confirming the election of social, socialist Salvador Allende as president. The kidnapping failed, but General Rene Sh uh, Schneider was shot and died two days later, the day Allende, Allende's election was confirmed. CIA admits prior knowledge of the plot that overthrew Allende three years later, but denies direct involvement. The report says that the agency had no idea that Allende would refuse safe passage with his palace under bombardment and apparently kill himself. He was found dead of gunshot wounds. I think he's skipping it because Allende cannot be spun in any negative fashion. He can't make the argument that he somehow deserved it. I mean, some of these other ones he didn't like really uh, spin in a. Uh, he didn't. He didn't necessarily spin those in a fucking negative way either. Yeah, here's the covert action in Chile staff report. If you would like to uh, look at it, it's extensive documentation that that shows our involve our level of involvement in Chile. Would you rather he didn't make a video highlighting U.S. foreign meddling on a video briefly mentioning the scale of it? Personally, I think that highlighting it in general is a good thing. More people will read about it, etc. Um, I mean, I think that uh, covering it by at least saying, briefly just saying like, you know, we did horrific things there would be nice. But also on top of that, uh, I mean, this part is like completely unacceptable in my opinion and we've decided that because the evidence is not rock solid we're going to cut it for time but definitely some crazy shit went down i'm not saying it didn't Okay, we're back in Africa, and it's the 80s, and over here in Libya, the dictator, Muammar Gaddafi, was making lots of trouble in the region, funding terrorist groups and working to expand his influence all over the region. Then For the record, some of these leaders, like, you know, Allende, even though he had some, you know, I guess, by 2023, liberal standards, problematic takes about certain things. Uh, one thing I have to mention to you is that none of these leaders are perfect, okay? No one is. It's, it's almost, it's virtually impossible to be perfect, especially if you're fighting against like a brutal dictator uh, when you're trying to, 
uh, when you are trying to you know, gain independence, fight a revolutionary war, whatever. I mean, there are some. Um, there are some that he doesn't really mention all that much. Um, but as far as like Gaddafi, yeah, he's a fucking freak. Okay, he did some crazy shit. But ultimately, um, what I would, where I would place him is just like a nation that was definitely better off with Gaddafi than uh, without him. Then he gets a call from his neighbor, Chad, asking for help against a rebellion. Gaddafi eagerly sends 4,000 troops to occupy a huge part of the country and makes friends with the new president by helping him exile his rival. And soon Gaddafi's getting greedy and threatening to merge Chad into Libya. The U.S. is not huh. into this. So Ronald Reagan fires up the well-oiled coup machine, launching a covert war, sending weapons and cash to rebels in Chad and supporting that political opponent who was ousted, helping him fight back. And it works. The president of Chad has to flee, and the U.S.-backed and supported leader comes to power. And now there's a conflict, and the CIA continues arming the war even after this guy is in office. The new U.S.-backed leader rules brutally for eight years, until he's eventually overthrown by a military officer, and in 2013, he was charged with crimes against humanity, torture, and war crimes. Okay, now let's go to this little island in 1983. It's communism again, and the U.S. sends 2,000 troops to invade this small remote island and remove their communist leader. They didn't really know much about this small island, and they literally had to use tourism maps to plan their invasion. Anyway, American forces move in, overwhelm the Grenadian fighters who happen to be joined by their Cuban allies. The government collapses, and the U.S.-friendly leader comes to power. Okay, back down to Central America. It's 1989, and we're here in Panama, where the U.S. has control of a very important canal. And luckily, the Panamanian dictator has been very friendly to American interests. But the U.S. starts losing confidence in this guy, wondering if he's really the best choice, ensuring the U.S. maintain easy access to their vital canal. Oh, and it didn't help that this guy was indicted in Florida on drug trafficking and money laundering charges. We gotta get... Wait... Is Iran Contra not a part of this? Like, did he just not have time? Or, I mean, I guess it's not a. Get him out. But the straw that broke the camel's back for this guy was when Panamanian troops killed an unarmed American soldier in Panama City. The U.S. is done with this guy, so they invade Panama with 27,000 troops. Panama's military is crushed, and the dictator is eventually arrested and sentenced to 40 years in prison. And the U.S. ensures access to its canal after all. Okay, so now it's the end of the 1980s and the Soviets are invading Afghanistan. And are meeting resistance from a bunch of fighters from all over the world who have come to Afghanistan to fight back against the Soviet occupation. Many of them with fundamentalist religious motivations. But the US doesn't care about their motivation. They just care that they're willing to fight against the Soviets and the Soviets puppet, the Afghan president. And it totally works. This part is not even true. Okay, out of all of the fucking people that they're talking about, the one instance where they, like, actually point to a person who, like, would at the very least, like, consider them to be fucking, con consider themselves to be communist, despite, despite the fact that the USSR also thought that he was uh, not the greatest, okay, uh, not the best, is this fucking guy, okay? Secondly, the arming and funding of Mujahideen rebels predates uh, uh predates reagan operation cyclone is just like the official recognized version but there but you know it, it it goes it goes beyond that the the uh the arming radicalizing and funding of rebels goes back to carter it predates the ussr invasion of afghanistan so that definitely that that is definitely uh i mean i guess he's never going to mention that clearly that would not with the help of the U.S., these fighters push the Soviets back and successfully run the Afghan president out of office. And as he's being run out of office, he forebodingly warned. They invaded. They were invaded. They were asked to be there. Yeah, I I know, but like, come on. I think it's because like they they now talk about Operation Cyclone more openly in the in the twentieth anniversary of nine eleven and all that shit. So they just like. They they just go with like Operation Cyclone, and they these were brave Mujahideen rebels that like 
wanted to fight against uh, communism or whatever. But like the real problem for Mohammed Najibullah was that they were they were ruthless towards uh, straight up. They were ruthless towards uh, anyone and everyone that was, uh, you know, practicing Islam. They were they were the original, let's say, Reddit atheists uh, of their of their time. You know, not great for for sure. Not great. So, once again, as is the case with every single fucking uh, U.S. operation, every single, uh, you know, every single overthrowing of, of uh, prior administrations, there's usually at least, like, some groups that have legitimate and some groups that have illegitimate animosity towards the whatever, whatever formation, whatever, like, uh, form of governance they have. If it's not the fucking extremely wealthy, if it's not like a chamber of commerce backed coup, it's it usually uh, more reactionary factions that they beef up, give arms to, and also weaponize against the government, for sure. But yes, Mohammed Najibullah or the the Afghan young communists that became uh, that you know that that got into uh, leadership were seen as aggressive by the USSR as well. They were, their, their involvement in Afghanistan was fraught. They did not originally, they were not like excited to extract minerals or whatever the fuck some people uh, say. I mean, that came along with it for sure. But there were certainly, um, there were certainly a lot of res uh, reservations before going into Afghanistan. Be fair, the Soviets also overthrew the socialist government in Afghanistan in favor of more aligned with them because the original socialist government was considering reproachment with the U.S. and Pakistan. Warns the Americans that if they leave Afghanistan in the hands of these fighters, that it would, quote, be turned into a center for terrorism. And his prophecy was completely fulfilled. Those U.S.-funded fighters were people whose names we know today. Osama bin Laden, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, the guy who started the group that would eventually become ISIS. Those same weapons that the U.S. sent to counter the Soviets and to effect regime change in Afghanistan would go on to be used against American soldiers years later, when the U.S. was back, orchestrating yet another regime change after 9-11, against the very groups they once enabled. The U.S. would eventually leave Afghanistan, only to find the country immediately falling back into Taliban rule. We're almost to the end of our list, and we're now in modern day. It's 2003, and 150,000 American troops invade Iraq. They say that they are there to find and destroy weapons of mass destruction. But their main focus is taking out this guy, Saddam Hussein. This part is like, just as, first of all, every single part of this is just as complicated. You just have more access to information because it's like more relevant to contemporary politics than all the other ones. So, remember... All of the things that you do know about Afghanistan, all the things that you do know about Iraq, all the things that you do know, remember, these are, this is like, you know, all of the tactics that the United States utilize in these places, they utilize in all the other places as well. Which they do in a matter of weeks. I'm not going to say anything, okay? You guys keep wanting me to say America deserved the top of the hour ad break. I'm not going to say it, but the top of the hour ad break is upon us regardless. And if you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe, which you could do for $5 or for free. Yes, this is something that I mention regularly. Uh, U.S. President Carter's National Security Advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, and his uh, flex mode on a French, uh, on a, on a French publication, uh, openly talking about how we were going to turn Afghanistan into Vietnam for the USSR. And by God, we did. Uh, which led to the evisceration of the USSR. So I would see that as an overall success. This literally, I've quoted this so many fucking times uh, on this broadcast. Anyway, um, but yeah, the former director of the CIA, Robert Gates, stated in his previous memoirs that American intelligence services began to aid the Mujahideen in Afghanistan six months before the Soviet intervention. In this period, you were the national security advisor, President Carter. You therefore played a role in this affair. Is that correct? Yes, according to the official version of history, CIA aid to the Mujahideen began during the 1980s, that is to say, after the Soviet army invaded Afghanistan. But the reality, secretly guarded until now, is completely otherwise. Indeed, it was July 3rd, 1979, that President Carter signed the first directive for secret aid to the opponents of pro-Soviet regime in Kabul. And that very 
And that very day, I wrote a note to the president in which I explained to him that, in my opinion, this aid was going to induce a Soviet military intervention. Despite this risk, you were an advocate for this covert action, but perhaps you yourself desired the Soviet entry into war and looked to provoke it. It isn't quite that. We didn't push the Russians to intervene, but we knowingly increased the probability that they would. When the Soviets justified their intervention by asserting that they intended to fight against the secret involvement of the United States in Afghanistan, people didn't believe them. However, there was a basis of truth. You don't regret anything today? Regret what? That secret operation was an excellent idea. It had the effect of drawing the Russians into the Afghan trap. And you want me to regret it? The day the Soviets officially crossed the border, I wrote to President Carter. We now have the opportunity of giving to the USSR its Vietnam War. Indeed, for almost 10 years, Moscow had to carry on a war unsupportable by the government. A conflict that brought about the demoralization and finally the breakup of the Soviet Empire. And neither do you regret having supported the Islamic fundamentalism, having given arms and advice to future terrorists. What is most important to the history of the world? The Taliban or the collapse of the Soviet Empire? Some stirred up Muslims or the liberation of Central Europe and the end of the Cold War? You know, this would never happen again. We would never do that. So please stop saying we did that. Please. Yeah, Mika from Morning... Is, it, is that real? Is this actually uh, Mika from Morning Joe's dad? That's crazy. Anyway, um, I forgot to run the hour at the top of the hour ad break, by the way, after saying I was going to run it. Some stirred up Muslims, but it has been said and repeated, Islamic fundamentalism represents a world menace today. Nonsense! It is said... That the West had a global policy in regard to Islam. That is stupid. There isn't a global Islam. Look at Islam in a, a rational manner and without demagoguery or emotion. It is the leading religion of the world with 1.5 billion followers. But what is there in common among Saudi Arabian fundamentalism, moderate Morocco, Pakistan militarism, Egyptian pro-Western and Central Asian secularism? Nothing more than what unites the Christian countries. Kind of fucked up. He didn't mention list CIA client states. Yeah, but like he didn't mention Turkey, which is kind of messed up, I think. Anyway, um, you want him to mention Turkey? I'm just saying like we always like to be at the table. Fun fact, Edward Shavard Nadze, the foreign minister of the USSR at the time, also the second president of Georgia, was responsible for forcing Najibullah to stay in Afghanistan as well as the USSR staying in Afghanistan for so long might literally be responsible for how Afghanistan is today. Central Asian secularism, Turkey. Yeah. Okay. Now let's get to Saddam. It's enabled. The U.S. would eventually leave Afghanistan, only to find the country immediately falling back into Taliban rule. We're almost at the end of our list, and we're now in modern day. It's his son, Mika's brother, is our ambassador to Poland. What a wonderful mark the Brzezinski's have left in our, in our uh, politics, dude. That's so sick. Mika, Mark, even some chatter said he was based. Some people really hate Islam. Yeah, bro, I wonder why. Of course they fucking hate Islam. They grew up in America in a post-9... They, they had their adolescence in a post-9-11 America. The fact that they're like... I'm shocked that it took 20 years for Americans to like no longer openly want to fucking murder Muslim people on the streets. Like it, it, it's one thing that Matt Chrisman said when a Sunni Muslim was running on, uh, on the Republican ticket. Okay. Against John Fetterman, Dr. Oz, the fact that there were no like Islamophobic questioning, no, no, mentions of islamophobic sentiment in that process is wild to me okay they just kicked ilhan off of committees yes of course that still exists but you're crazy if you think that that is like the fact that ilhan omar is on a fucking the foreign affairs committee is my proof that like she was on a committee to begin with is proof that like we have you know we have moved beyond that uh that style of politics like People don't consider 
people don't necessarily consider, uh, you know, Islam to be the same kind of threat it once was. That's why there's so much hidden and sometimes open animosity, even from a liberal perspective. Because remember, just like with anti-blackness, which is a core value of, you know, a, a fundamental of like American societal development, okay? Americans always have a way to get every type of American to find their own reasons to to despise our uh the, our our state department designated enemies okay republicans hate him cuz they're brown that's easy right but then democrats hate him cuz like they're barbaric democrats hate him because they don't believe in liberal values we need to be the civilizing force right so It's very, um, a very unique way to do it. I mean, it's just like same with same with anti blackness, for example. You know what I mean? There is a very liberal way to engage in like anti black rhetoric. There's a very liberal way that anti black rhetoric is is uh, uh, permeated through liberal academic circles. Like black men are aggressive and violent towards uh, you know black women and uh, gay and trans black members of their own communities like that is a a very um yeah there there that's a very liberal way to basically say the same shit that like racist people say you know what i mean i mean not racist but like republican conservatives say it's the angry black man that's a violent savage trope being sanitized to be more appropriate appropriately disseminated through liberal uh, circles. You know? The reason why I'm mentioning that is because... The reason why I'm mentioning that is because, like, the same, the same exact thing can happen for... Uh, the same exact thing can happen for America's common enemies. America waged a war against Islam for a very long time. How do you make... How do you market that war or at least people who would otherwise be like doves and, you know, anti-war activists. How do you get those guys to also be on board? Well, you tell them like, you tell them Muslims are uh, anti-gay. They're throwing gay people off buildings, you know? They're, they're fucking, they're backwards. They, they mistreat women, that sort of thing. That's how you do it. Which is why I am, again, shocked that like, They've kind of dropped that, uh, they kind of dropped that, that like that strategy has like, that strategy is like not something that they apply as much anymore. It's 2003 and 150,000 American troops invade Iraq. They say that they are there to find and destroy weapons of mass destruction, but their main focus is taking out this guy, Saddam Hussein, which they do in a matter of weeks. Saddam fleeing into hiding and President Bush declaring mission accomplished establishing an American-friendly government in Iraq, creating once again a negative byproduct by alienating huge swaths of the Iraqi people and army who form a bunch of anti-American rebel groups that go on to fight against the American occupation, some morphing into groups like ISIS who wreak all kinds of havoc on the region to this day. Once again, I made a whole video about this topic. Go check it out. Iraq remains a place of deep political instability. Trust in government is extremely low. And the question of how and why we did this expensive, horrific, destructive coup is still something that there aren't really good answers to. Again, you can go watch my video for more on it. Yeah, th what? No, there is, man. What the fuck? It's not even just oil. Afghanistan, opium, and, and you know, minerals. But, like, no. Every single thing that he's mentioning, in many ways, is not just about, like, destroying communism. It's also about uh, a, a, a industry that was growing permanently, especially accelerated after Eisenhower, that basically became our most prominent and sole industry. The military-industrial complex. That's it. Like, that's... We don't need to literally fucking... We don't need to, like you know, have a good reason or natural resources that we must extract from these countries half the fucking time anymore because, like, 
we have this machine that demands blood. First, we give the weapons, then we use our new weapons against the old weapons that we gave to the fucking area. That's it. On that. And this gets us to the final coup on our list. It's 2011. Bro, I'm Kurdish. When I went there as a child, I was 12, 13 years old. Uh, it was the time Saddam was just taken. Americans were there like shit, talk, taking control of all the oil places. The only ministry that did not fucking get eviscerated in the American invasion of Iraq was the Ministry of Energy. That's it. Like, that's, that's it. That, that's all you fucking need to know in that one. You know what I mean? During a wave of protests spreading throughout this region, trying to take down all these strongmen dictators, one of which was this guy, Muammar Gaddafi, the same Gaddafi we were talking about earlier, who's like taking over Chad. He's still here and he's still a very horrible dude. And there's worry that he's going to potentially massacre all of these pro-democracy protesters. Yeah. So the U.S. feels like it must get involved. Bro, come on. How can you fucking seriously say this, bro? How can you seriously do an entire video on, on coup d'etats that we have, like, facilitated? Okay. How can we, how can you look at that and then be like, the U.S. always found a way to, you know, drum up support. The U.S. always found a way to drum up support with when, uh, you know, inside of like uh, reactionary forces within the country, blah, 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 always. And then when it comes to Libya, the closer you get to like modern day, the more his narrative is just like, yeah, these were pro-democracy people that like he was trying to fucking execute because they just wanted to do uh, democracy, I think. That's why they were, you know, that's, that's what the fuck was happening. It was just like his hatred for democracy overtook. And America loves democracy in my video where I talk about all of the instances where America has like overthrown democratically elected leaders involved to save these all of these pro-democracy protesters. So the U.S. feels like it must get involved to save these protesters. They rally their NATO ally. That statement in and of itself is like gross, dude. The U.S. felt like it had to be involved. The U.S. felt like it needed to be involved because they wanted to save protesters what the fuck what's nato doing there yeah what's going on there lies to help them but at some point the mission wait what do you mean that's like that's a that's a guys nato is a defensive force you guys surely surely are not going to make the argument that nato was in was being weaponized as an offensive force again nato is simply a defensive force that surely would never happen stop I guess their their uh their never ending love for their never ending love for uh democracy led them to, you know, do a no fly zone and, and send missiles. He's not doing an ironic he's not doing an ironic voice. He fucking means this. Switches to total regime change. We don't All right, hold on, hold on. Allies to help feels like it must get involved to save these protesters they rally their nato allies to help them but at some point bro that's crazy he literally said these guys were forced these guys were forced uh you know gaddafi forced their hand gaddafi forced their fucking hand into uh gaddafi forced their hand into fucking uh you know by attacking de democracy protesters and then the mission somehow switched they went in to save people, and the mission somehow switched. Point, the mission switches to total regime change. Just like, yeah, just like we were locked into, just like we were locked into uh, Vietnam. We don't know exactly how this happened. Only yeah, we don't know how. That, that's crazy. Only the people in the room do. But is it surprising? We've seen this long arc of the U.S. using the coup as a force for getting their way in an international conflict. It's a tried and true tool in the American foreign policy toolkit. So it's not surprising that a coup becomes a solution during these difficult decision-making processes. Libya had the highest score on the human development index before we attacked and now has open air slave markets and a collapsed economy. European and American oil companies have new access to oil contracts though. Don't worry, bro. Erdogan's going to save Libya, okay? Leaked Hillary Clinton email re uh, revealed NATO killed Gaddafi to stop the formation of a United States of Africa. 
What? On what? I don't know if this is. Uh, I don't know. I don't think that. The, uh, okay. Like, I feel like this, this is, uh, I remember these, uh, I remember these emails. Sam Cedar says that he wrongly supported the no-fly zone at the beginning because not only the U.S., but China and Russia and U.N. reported it as a crisis needing intervention. Yeah, Qaddafi was 100% a Pan-Africanist, but there was zero political momentum for that during the time of his death in 2011 law. Yeah. The thing, the thing about Qaddafi is that, like, he is a bit of an enigma, okay? I, I'll just say it like that. There is, like, there's not a lot of consistent principles. A lot of people try to bring it up and and make it seem like he had a lot of, um, like, he had a lot of, like, you know, genuine interest that work. This is it. He did some good things. Uh, but I don't think that, like, I, I just don't, I don't think that he was, uh, you know, all too concerned with uh, genuinely creating uh, a, a a African Union, a United Nation of uh, United Nations of Africa, you know what I mean. None of which, of course, uh, deserves the U.S. involvement and the subsequent, you know, ass fucking that he got from a bayonet on camera, which Hillary Clinton laughed about. Um. But also on top of that, more importantly than Gaddafi as a person uh, who, you know, did some very interesting and sometimes very fucked up shit, uh, the people of Libya did not deserve the, the aftermath of uh, this involvement. Anyway, I, I don't think that this, was a, this constituted a valid enough threat uh, to America. So anyway, the target Western becomes interest. Qaddafi, and now NATO drones are firing missiles at his convoy, and he eventually gets captured and gets killed on the spot. Libya has been in chaos ever since, but it's not like it was a great place under Gaddafi. And once again, it objectively was a better place under Gaddafi. That is an insane thing to state. You're literally comparing at least a developed nation state. What the fuck? That is an insane fucking assessment, dude. Again, Johnny, liberal, I love the CIA Harris, straight up lapping the Republican Party's assessment on the situation. Like he is, he is outright winging the Republicans on this matter. Like even Republicans who are like, yeah, I don't really give a fuck, at least because of Clinton's involvement, say like, look at Libya, there's open slave markets. Johnny Harris is more to the right than like fucking neocons, dude. Holy shit. I mean, that's like pretty unhinged, to be honest. Oh my God. I just realized why chat's making. Oh, dude. I forgot that Johnny Harris is a Mormon, ex Mormon. <laughs> that's why chat keeps making Mormon jokes. I was like, why the fuck are chat making Mormon jokes, dude? <laughs> okay, listen. <coughs> that does not mean. That does not mean he's automatically CIA, dude. What the fuck? We've had two Catholic presidents now, okay? This is a different time in America. It's not, Mormons aren't automatically CIA now. Again, we're in a gray area where we don't know the history that didn't happen or how things could have turned out different if the U.S. didn't get involved. That debate lives on. Okay, so that's our list. These are our coups that we decided to go over in this video. There are so many more that we could have mentioned. My purpose in doing this broad back-to-back -back history of American-led okay. coups Why is he doing was so this? that we can see patterns that emerge. Uh -huh. How a rising superpower became really cool. good at removing leaders that didn't yeah. align with their way of seeing the world. Okay. Or in a lot of cases who were not friendly to American business interests. Fair, but fair. let's be clear, the US didn't invent this. This is something that powerful countries and empires have always done. We don't look at what that positively though. Though, that's the difference because like we understand that like imperialism was like objectively bad you know colonialism was objectively bad i think everybody understands that okay this is u.s-led coups especially during the cold war was how the overthrow of these governments uh -huh. often stamped out new democracies budding yeah, democratic true, movements true. replacing them with authoritarian leaders who would go on to oppress the people He's with right. the support and backing of the united Keep states cooking. and okay. in the process redirecting the country's history Lately, uh -huh. Russia has been meddling in the election process of the United States. And I've been reflecting.
What? <laughs> no! No! He did not! No! Bro! It's so weird that at no point did Johnny Harris say, like, uh, you know, the United States did Facebook ads in, in fucking Chile. Like, that was... It almost feels like, uh, you know, arming and funding rebel groups, reactionary, fascist, violent, genocidal rebel groups who then execute the leader of the state that was, like, democratically elected versus, like, Facebook ads that they bought using American companies to... to run misinformation campaigns like hold on reflecting on my feelings towards that the violation of having an external power sowing doubt and polarization and fear in my own democracy in my own society it feels like russia set up radio free florida <laughs> did america not do this in russia with Gorbachev? america did this with everyone and still continues to do it if you see a radio free that is like Voice of America, Radio Free Ukraine, Radio Free whatever the fuck. Like, that's literally not even secret. Like, it's just openly, it's just basically openly fucking funded CIA propaganda. That, that extent, that's literally, that's it. That, that is like what Russia did, okay? That. And it wasn't, it's never just misinformation understand it's never just like america's biggest fault and failure isn't doing you know counter-revolutionary propaganda in these countries it's the other stuff that they did after it's like farming and and uh funding and arming the fucking uh the guys that are like out of their minds that's the way you do a coup not by just like misinforming the public you know what i mean Also, this is such funny. This is like one of those, um, you know, like every time like a, like an ML on Twitter will be like, look at all the American bases out around China. And then like one of those is like literally not even a base or it's like a Chinese island or something. And then sock them Twitter will like rip that apart. They'll be like, these guys are so fucking stupid. There aren't 300 bases around China. There's 298. You don't know anything about global politics. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> Johnny Harris is doing the reverse of that by making it seem like Russia has these like, you know, uh, islands of power around America, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Globe Twitter loves being like, you fucking idiot. <laughs> you don't know anything. Imagine showing this graphic that shows that there's like 400 military bases that have weapons directed at Russia when there's only 354. You're so stupid. <laughs> yeah. I wish Johnny Harris talked about the Chinese balloon. Anyway, Ontario, the greatest hub of Russian power. Such a violation, and it is. This is giving me just a tiny taste of what it feels like to have an outside power. What? First of all, it's not even new. The USSR used to do this shit too. What the fuck? There's a reason why. There's a reason why MLK and every other black liberation movement was not just put down because they were like fucking, uh, you know, black people trying to uh, uh, gain civil liberties, but also because they were communists, right? Like, yeah, the USSR did agitative propaganda. That is what it's called. It's called agitprop, okay? Yeah, of course they did that. What the fuck? That's never, that's a permanent fixture of society. That's like what warring nations or what, uh, you know, uh, countries do. It doesn't even have to have like, uh, some, some, you know, ideological underpinning. Russia now absolutely does that for both sides. Literally, like RT is a perfect example. If you look at, if you look at Russia today, they'll have programming that at, at like 5 p.m. is like 
America KKK uh, is an imperialist warring nation and we must abolish white supremacy in the United States as it is a global superpower funding white supremacy. And then at 5.30, they're like, <laughs> and at 5.30, they're like, you know the homosexuals in America are degenerate perverts and must be eradicated at all costs. It's like, they do that. They don't give a shit. They literally have no, they have no like, uh, they, they have no genuine ideological reason. They just want to like cause chaos, okay? And that's nothing. America does that too with ideological reasoning, uh, which is pro-capitalist for the most part. I'm literally the Twitter ML in the scenario you described. <sighs> anyway. Pulling the strings in your country, tearing it apart for their own purposes, and in the process creating more problems for the people and for the United States itself, undermining any semblance of democracy or development, all in the name of keeping the U.S. on top and dominant over the globe.